All right, folks, so in this video, which is sponsored by my good buds at Squarespace, we're gonna create this looping plane animation, we'll cover a lot of animation tips and tricks, as well as go into the materials, lighting, creating that ground object using some AI images, and who knows what else. We created the plane in another video, so be sure to check that one out first, but for those who are ready to rock, let's. All right, so I've got my whole file basically finished out here. This is the animation that I posted on Instagram, and this is what will be uh, the file available to patrons. Um, I just wanted to start breaking this down, so just kind of recreating it step by step. So if you followed along with the previous tutorial, you should already have a plane built out and then a little bit of lighting in your scene too. Uh, you will not have the ground and the clouds, but you will have a plane. And I want to, yeah, just walk you through kind of first by creating this motion to just get our feet a little bit wet with some animation. The propeller spinning is pretty easy. So I've parented this object to this nose cone object. And to get that rotation, um, I'm just pulling up a graph editor here so I can see what's actually going on. But um, I've just got uh, one frame at frame zero. Um, let's just let's just clear this out and then kind of recreate that motion so you can see how that works. Um, so I'm gonna clear these keyframes. So I would just start this at maybe um, zero degrees and then I would right click and insert single keyframe. And then I would go to the end of my animation, which in this case is frame 180 because I'm working in 30 frames per second. Um, so that would give us a six second animation. So frame 180, uh, I'm just going to basically want to make sure I have a multiple of 360 so that we have full rotations. So I'll just do um, I'll just do 360 times, I think I did about 20 rotations. Uh, and then we'll do right click, insert single keyframe, and then we'll have that rotating properly. Now you want to make sure that your first frame isn't on frame one. Um, otherwise you would have two frames that are identical. So uh, the way to fix that is either just dragging this to 181 or what I usually like to do is just have the same frames be zero, which does not get rendered, and then frame 180. So now we have this working properly. Now, if you wanted this just to be a constant motion, you could change this to linear, just to select everything up here in the graph editor, and uh, pressing T will uh, bring up that menu to set your keyframe interpolation. Just change that to linear. Um, what I actually ended up doing for the final, though, was just sort of manually um, rotate this. So I want this motion to stay the same, so I'm gonna set my pivot point with a period to be the individual centers, and then just rotate this, just so that they're about the same. And then, so, so we have almost linear interpolation, but then I think I just added another keyframe right here and just kind of flatten that out a tad, just so that the um, propeller kind of slows down a little bit in the middle, just adding a little bit more interest there. So that's how we did the propeller animation. Um, the next thing I wanna do is just uh, show you how we did this kind of up and down motion. So. Um, it's pretty simple. This is the kind of final keyframes we ended up with. Add a little extra wobble in there, but let's just run through the basics real quick. I'm going to press Alt-G and Alt-R to right, reset my uh, location and rotation. Let's just clear all these out. And so now we're just zeroed out. We just have our propeller spinning. Uh, I do also have a little animation on the camera there. We won't worry about that for now, but we'll cover it in a moment. The up and down motion. So. The way I do that, again, remembering you want your first frame to be actually on frame zero, and then your matching frame to be on 180. So uh, in the case of location, I'm just gonna go down a little bit, and then I can either select the keyframe here and shift D to duplicate it over to 180, or just before um, you change anything, you could just add another keyframe. Um, so now I wanna go up about the same amount, something like that, just so we have this nice curve here. So when it's going up and down, I want the nose of the airplane to kind of also be going up and down. And the way we can do that is by control, controlling this X rotation. So let's just do uh, something similar. Now we'll line this up after the fact, but we know at one point it'll be pointing up. And then let's just go to frame 180 and duplicate that keyframe. And then somewhere else it will be pointing down. So let's just insert a keyframe there and press space bar. And this is kind of working. Um, it, it's not quite a realistic motion though because the, the plane would actually start to tilt up a little bit first, I think. Or basically we don't want these to happen in sync. So what I'm gonna do is um, we'll just double click that rotation and then just kind of pull it over a little bit and see if our motion's looking a little more natural. So that's feeling a little bit better. Uh, now the problem we've introduced though is we don't have a perfect loop here. Um, so we would need to 
you know, now that this isn't ending at frame 180, it's like ending some sort of some weird place kind of right here. Um, rather than just trying to copy that value, we'll select the X rotation and add a cycles modifier to it. And we can just also add that to the Z location. So let's add in the cycles modifier there too. Um, now, as long as the space between the first and the last frame stays at 180 frames, um, then we should be able to slide this kind of around wherever we want and just experiment until the, the motion looks about right. So that's feeling a little bit better. And we basically do the same thing for the side to side motion. So I'll just do that really quickly. So I've got that sort of recreated and I'm just going to kind of slide this over again until our motion seems right. You know, we kind of have that tilt before we actually see the movement. So I think something like that is working pretty good. Now let's talk really quickly about this camera. So the way I have it set up now is we just have this empty in the middle of the scene, which I've named cam control. Um, and that's just allowing me to sort of set that angle that I want. So got it just kind of tilted down a little bit where we'll eventually put the ground. And then, you know, I could also control the rotation here. Now, one of the big reasons I set it up this way is that to move the camera in, in and out, then I just need to control this one value. And in this case, I just inserted some simple keyframes so that it kind of pulls out a little bit in the middle, very subtle, and then pushes back in a little bit, just adding a little bit more dynamic motion to the scene. Besides that, with the camera, we do have a depth of field object set. So that is just set to the plane control object. So there's just this empty right here. And that kind of gives us a little bit of depth of field. You can't see it much on the airplane itself, but when you put the ground in, then you will start to see that. So let's go ahead and start talking about that ground. Let's take a look at it first. Um, maybe we actually move the clouds and stuff to their own collection. So we've got some different lights here, uh, which we're gonna talk about all these in just a minute. I'm gonna move these to a new collection and we'll call that, uh, we'll just call that clouds. All right, let's hold it right there to talk for a second about the sponsor of today's video, Squarespace. Squarespace is your all-in-one website, web store, web portfolio, whatever web you need builder. I used Squarespace to start my freelance business years ago, and it was one of the best decisions I ever made, giving clients a place to both view my work as well as reach out and hire me. That was a long time ago, but since then, Squarespace has continued to improve the platform, adding more new and fantastic features like the Fluid Engine, giving you unbreakable creativity when it comes to your site. Don't wait any longer and get started by saving 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain using code DIRK. Now, back to the video. So we have, yeah, basically this is a pretty simple thing to set up as well. Um, but once again, let's just go ahead and rebuild this so that you can see kind of exactly how I created it if you're interested in creating your own from scratch. So first thing to do would just be, let's just move our cursor to the middle of the scene and I'm gonna go ahead and save and then just delete um, this thing here because we're gonna recreate it. Um, so we actually had multiple things here. We had some little houses as well. Let's delete those and just recreate them. So the way we're gonna do that is um, just adding in a plane of known size. Let's just have this be five meters. So um, when that when we change the scale here, we need to apply the scale. So let's just apply that scale. And I want to just sort of build out a singular kind of piece of farmland, if you will. Um, so the way I'm doing that is just by right clicking and subdividing, and then I'll just repeat that action once. And then I'm just gonna select sort of some random areas here, um, just by my, by my hand, and then I to inset them, and then I'll bring them up a little bit on the Z axis. And then let's just select some other ones, I to inset them, G and Z to bring it up a little bit. And then let's just select whichever we have left, which I think is just those ones and this one too. And let's do the same thing, I'd inset G and Z to bring it up. And then what I'll do just to smooth this out a little bit is add in a bevel modifier, which we'll do some sort of weird stuff there. I think we could fix that if we just maybe extrude this down. Now we've got some weird kind of clipping there, but that's okay. Um, I don't think that that's gonna mess up our array as long as we do our array first and then our bevel. 
Um, so yeah, that's gonna be how we actually build this ground up. Let's move this out a little bit, look through our camera over here, and then just get this into sort of a decent place. And then I'm gonna add in an array modifier. And let's make sure that this is before the bevel. Okay, so now we shouldn't have that issue. So we can use the relative offset here. That's gonna be totally fine. And we just want a couple going in this direction, just sort of to fill our background. And then let's also add in another array but have it go the other direction. And we need to, again, make sure this is before the bevel so that that's all cinched up nicely. And we can use these merge options also on the array modifier, just so that it's nice and tight. Um, so this is good. We just need to add in a few more, I think at least going this direction. Um, and now if you're having trouble getting this framed in your background, I didn't mention it, but I have my focal length on my camera set at 150 millimeters. The lower that is, especially if it's at the default, which is a much lower value, um, then you're gonna see more. So if you use a longer focal length, you won't have to have quite so much in the background. You could of course even render this with like a, you know, an orthographic view if you wanted. That could be a kind of a cool style. But I'm gonna leave that in perspective with a longer focal length of about 150. So we have our ground set up there. Now to animate that, we are just going to, remember we made that exactly five meters wide. So we just wanna make sure that this is moving a multiple of five on the Y axis. And I think we want it to move this way. So let's start it down here. Let's just start it at negative five, insert a keyframe. And then we just need to make sure that this moves, you know, an increment of five. So let's just go to zero there. Let's set that to linear and let's see if we have our loop. And it looks like we do. So in this view, you don't see the loop. But again, that's why it's good to have sort of a rendered view over here, maybe where you can check uh, if that loop is working properly. And it looks like we're in pretty good shape there. Um, now, I also didn't mention on the camera, but I'll do it now. Um, I did have a damped track constraint on the camera. You can see if we turn this off, um, the camera just stays still and the kind of plane moves around within the frame. When I turn this on, I can basically have the camera kind of tracking with the plane. So it's actually moving a little bit. Now I don't like it to fully track with it because I think it's nice to have a little bit of that lag there. Um, but that's just another thing I did not mention that I wanted to make sure it got called out. Um, so we're in good shape with the ground here. As far as the actual material for it, let's add in that. So let's go into our um, object settings, object material, and then I'll just do a new material. Now, the way I started this off was by, I want to just make it green because that white is blasting my eyes, but you can do something simple. I mean, this depends on kind of the design you want on the ground, of course. But what I actually did was use an image from Midjourney that I created. Uh, let me open that up here. Uh, I did a few of them. I think that this is the one I used. So I typed in can actually, I think, see it here. Let's let's go bring open a UV image editor. Just so I can show you my prompt, full screen, top down, aerial view of green farmland. I think that was the whole prompt. Um, but yeah, just smacking that bad boy on there. I used all four, just kind of, you know, they all had sort of unique characteristics. Um, but you know, get whatever image you want. You just need something to sort of fill that ground up. Again, once you have some depth of field on their camera, you're, you're not gonna be seeing it too clearly. Of course, depending on how much depth of field you added, but that's sort of a stylistic choice. Now to actually get this mapped a little bit more properly, uh, I think what I did first was U and then project from view, which will just kind of get this all mapped properly. Now, if you just wanted to use one of these, you know, something like this would be a good place to start. But uh, what I thought was cool was actually to just go in and select some different areas, um, like maybe these, just until you have sort of a unique layout. Now in my original material, I'll call this ground two. I did a few more things. Um, let's just take a peek at those really quick. I think I have, yeah, it's saved as earth. So I, I actually did some control over the colors so that it wasn't like every color. You don't really need to do that. The, the more important things though, let's do those first. I'm gonna set that back there. Um, I made the material rough. So dragging the roughness all the way to one. And then I wanted a little bit of bumpiness on there. So I'm gonna add in a input into the normal and add a vector bump. And then you can set this to a pretty low value, the distance, and make sure it's plugged into the height. And then you can just control the strength and that just gives us a little bit more depth. Again, this is kind of a background element. You know, you might not necessarily see it, but again, just giving a little bit of interest to our background. 
Now, if you want to make this blend in with the sky a little bit more, one thing I did was add in a mix color and let's just have that be the first color and then just pick a color from your sky. So I'm just going to my B color, just pick the sky here and then uh, you can kind of mix that original, you know, textured color with the sky color. And that's a good way to sort of fake some atmospheric perspective where we have you know, a little bit of blueness kind of casting into the color there so that now another thing you could do is within this object, you know, as long as you're just operating in this main area here, since we're using the constant offset, you could just duplicate this, you know, you could add in some other little objects, little things just to start to kind of cast some shadows onto the rest of this object. But that is how I created the ground and just gave it a little bit more dynamicness to it. I love that word dynamicness. Don't think it's a word. Um, so save your file as you're moving along, but we've covered the propeller, we've covered the camera, we've covered the ground. I guess we can go ahead and look at the clouds now. It's probably a good place to start. So let's just turn these on. Um, I This is probably easier just to walk you through kind of what I did rather than completely recreating it. But these are just, um, these are just cubes. So, you know, all I did was just I guess we can recreate one. Let's um let's add in a cube and just put that right here and just kind of scale it till it's cloud size, move it around a little bit, duplicate it, something like that. And then I think what I did was add in a bevel just to give that a little bit of shape. Um, you can kind of make that as big as you want. Just one level is fine though, because then I think what I did was subdivide it. And then I think what I did was remesh it. So one of the reasons we need to remesh it is because if I apply my cloud material right onto this, we sort of have some you know funky intersections. You know, you can see one piece through the other, but I want this to appear all as one piece. So what I'll do is add in a remesh modifier. We don't need a lot of resolution here, but with that, we basically have, you know, it, it's kind of now all one watertight cloud tight piece. So the default options are pretty good for the remesh there, and that doesn't take too much memory. Now, the next thing I did, let's just take a peek over here. So we did the bevel, we did the subdivision, and yeah, you know, you could do another layer here. That doesn't matter too much though, because it's being remeshed. And then what I did was add a displacement. So the displacement that we added here, let's just go into the modifiers, add a displacement. You will need to create a new one just by clicking this new button, but I'll select the one that I already had created and let's pop over to the settings for that. So that is a clouds texture, of course. And it looks like I did add a little bit of a keyframe on the size of it, just so that as we were moving through the clouds, there's a little bit of kind of action happening there. You don't really want to see the edges of these clouds too clearly. And that's the reason why we really are adding this displacement is just to break up that frame a little bit. You know, if you're going for a more stylized look, then it might be cool to leave a more cube shaped, but that's what I did with the displacement. Uh, and then just maybe pulling this value down a little bit until you got a nice fried chicken looking cloud object. Um, as far as actually animating these clouds, you know, you could do an array technique so that, you know, there's clouds on the frame at the start and the end. But what I actually did was just, just move it off the frame. So it starts off and you can insert a keyframe there. And then you don't necessarily need to worry about these matching, but just make sure it's back off the frame by the end. And then if we set this to be a linear interpolation on the transform, then, you know, it should just look like it's kind of moving naturally along with everything else. And that's actually a nice effect too, where we've got sort of clouds moving at different paces. So that's something you could consider doing. And let's go back into our shader editor and just take a look at the cloud texture here. So I'm just gonna delete this cloud that I recreated and take a look at the texture. Um, before we do that though, let's hide the light. So we have a lightning object. Let's hide that. And then there's a couple other lighting elements there. So we just have our default world that's lighting these clouds now. And let's just take a look at this texture. Got a Voronoi texture. I don't know what, oh wait, this was, I was trying to create the lightning procedurally. I didn't actually end up doing that though. So let's just, uh, let's just delete that. Make a new material. We'll call it cloud two. And let's just see how close we can get. So first thing is going to be to delete the principal shader and add in a shader principled volume. We can drag that into the volume and you're pretty much all the way there. <laughs> Just uh, make this a nice bright white 
and then you can pull the density up on it sort of as much as you want. A little bit more dense will get you better reactions from the lighting in your scene. Um, and by the way, I'll make a note, this is going to work a lot better in cycles than EV if you're trying to do this in EV. But you can do actually some decent work with volumetrics in EV. Now to add more detail into this, I think the only other thing I mainly did was um, I'm pressing Control T with the Node Wrangler add-on. Um, I used a noise texture. So we'll do a texture, noise texture. And we can just have that be the object input. And then I use this to control the density. So right now I have the density at, uh, let's just say it's at four. Um, this noise texture is gonna be outputting values from zero to one. So the highest value here would be a one, but I want that back to a four. So I'm gonna use a converter and then a map range and select the max to be closer to what I had before at four, and then the minimum can be zero. Um, now we could use this same map range node to kind of crush these values and start to see that texture a little bit better. But I usually like to do that just a little bit more visually with a color ramp. So let's just drop that in there. Now, if I shift control and left click on this, you can see this is what the color ramp is doing. So I can just use that to sort of increase the contrast here. And, you know, I want some areas to be totally see-through and some to not be. And we might want, you know, just a little bit of distortion there because that seems like something clouds would have. We could also add in some additional detail and roughness just to make that detail nice and fine. Um, we're looking for a texture looks, maybe something like that, but let's plug this back all together and to disconnect it from the surface and see where we're at. So yeah, we could, we could bump this density up way high if we really wanna be able to see this easier. But now with the noise texture, you know, if we have more black area, that's gonna be more see-through. And again, the white is gonna be the most dense, which is now set to 20. So if we just pulled this back, you just sort of find a nice balance. We've got part of our sort of silhouette being broken up by the displacement modifier that's on here. Um, but then we just have an additional level of sort of break up happening with this noise texture. And it just adds a little bit more depth to the clouds. So feel free to play with these values and, and just find something that works for you. Let's just take a look. So we've got our new one that we recreated and then the other one, yeah, looks like I did essentially the exact same thing. Um, so yeah, that's all in good shape. Let's delete that and leave our original back in place. And remember to be saving your file as you're going along. But yeah, with these just moving along, we've got a nice loop. We've got a little motion happening there. Again, just by animating this size value right there. And we're not worried about those looping because they start off the frame and they end off the frame. And that's kind of the easiest, cheapest hack when you are doing looping animations, just get stuff off the frame and then reintroduce it when the animation loops. So we're in good shape. We covered the grounds. Let's talk a little bit about the lighting in this scene. So I'm going to change this to a world editor. So right now I just duplicated this animated version and I plugged it in just so that things wouldn't be moving around when I was working with them. But um, pretty simple here. I've just got, yeah, the um, the sky texture. So the sun is intensity drops at night, I believe. And then I also have the elevation dropping. That's kind of the main thing that's creating the, the sun setting effect. So here's sort of where we're at with it set. So we've got the rotation moved a little bit, just probably found, you know, a little bit more interesting shadows at night. So adjusted the rotation, elevation coming far down, you know, close to zero. It's basically gonna create a sunset effect. And then just a little more control over the strength of the background and the sun intensity, just to give us a little bit of a nice kind of daylight effect. And then a quick sunset when we enter into this scene and then sort of back to sun for the loop. So let's talk a little bit more about the other lighting. So that's just the, you know, I'm just using the Nishida sky here and that works really well to create a nice natural lighting. Um, but the other things I did were add in some lightning. So let's take a look at that. That was sort of a really fun thing to do, especially when you've got volumetrics in your scene. It's really fun to get sort of intense with the lighting. So the way that I did that was I started off, let's see if we can just recreate the lighting actually. So you can kind of see what's happening here. We just have this single point lamp sort of moving around throughout the animation and it has an animated power value. And then let's go to the actual shader settings. And I use a black body to set the color of that light. 
So that's what's giving it that nice blue. You know, if we set this to a, a lower value, we would get sort of a warmer lightning. But go for whatever look you want there. I think something like this looks pretty good. And the black body just gives realistic color temperatures. So the real magic here is happening though in the graph editor. So I animated the location of this, but then I also just added some jiggle to it with some noise modifiers. And, and that just helps it kind of feel a little more lightning-y. Um, so again, let's recreate that. I'm just gonna delete all these keyframes. And the way to start this out, so for one, parent it to your clouds object. And then I'm kind of just, I'm gonna set it what I want it to look like when it's fully lit up. So let's just call this like 1200 watts. And um, we could insert a keyframe now, let's not do that yet. Um, so I just want this to be kind of dancing through the clouds. So let's just find where we want to start. You know, maybe it starts right there. And then I'm gonna insert location keyframes. Then maybe it kind of comes beneath. So now this just kind of moves throughout, but it's a little bit of a, you know, the motion's gonna be a little bit static or a little weird. You know, we're gonna be flashing it on and off, but just to add even more dynamicness, dynamism, interest to this motion, um, I added in some modifiers. So. We can just select, I wonder if you can select them all at once. I don't think you can, but we can add a modifier, add a noise modifier, and look at that, it did, it added it to all of them. And that's just gonna jitter this, so it kind of moves around. Now I think you wanna mess with the phase on each of these just a tad so it doesn't have the exact same noise pattern, but you can control the strength, you know, maybe so it's not jittering quite so much. Um, and yeah, there's a few other controls you can change here, like the scale. That would help the jitter be a little less extreme. And really the flashing effect though is gonna just happen by animating the power of the light. So let's say we want a flash to happen. Let's just sort of animate one flash. So I'm gonna hide all these keyframes. Let's insert a keyframe for a flash. So that is it on. And then let's have it be an instant on. So right here, one frame before, we're gonna set that to zero, insert a keyframe, and then um, I'll let it fade out maybe over the course of just like two frames and maybe it doesn't go all the way out. Maybe it goes to like, you know, 200 so it gets less bright and then we could have it maybe flash back to the max 1200 insert keyframe and then what we can do is just basically repeat this effect a few times just sort of at random intervals. Maybe this one happens a little faster. And now we sort of have a nice lightning effect where the lightning is just sort of, you know, that point light, but it's just bouncing around to different places. And then we have these kind of sporadic lightning bursts throughout. And that is exactly how I created that effect. That was the clouds, the noise pattern on there, the texture. Um, we covered the lighting, some of the lighting. So I did have it at night. I had a moonlight sort of turn on which just added a little bit more interest, helped us see our plane a little bit better. Um, this one's really simple too. Uh, let's change this back over to a graph editor. So there's our sun elevation. Here's the, so the moon was a spotlight. And you can see if we rotate that, it just kind of illuminates a very specific area, which is where I want it just kind of right on the plane, something like that. Um, and then I just animated the power. So during the day, that light goes off, and then it kind of comes on at night to illuminate our plane through the cloudy area. And then it turns back off. Um, so that's as simple as that one is. And then the same thing with this light underneath. Um, so let's turn off the moon and let's actually turn off the lighting, lightning too. So I had this light just kind of provide a little bit of glow from the bottom. It's just adding a little bit of illumination from the bottom. If we hide this one, it's just a little bit darker. I was just kind of mimicking what might be light from the towns and villages underneath. Um, but again, this one during the day, it sort of turns off. And then at night, we have that kind of underglow light on. Um, but it's just a super wide area light with some lower spread, just so it's kind of going straight up into our cloud area there. But that's what ended up working out for me pretty well. There was another little thing that I did, which was... Um, I made another object. I'm just gonna select the corners here. Made some little lights on the ground. So let's put Shift D and Z. 
F to make a face. And now we just have sort of this other layer here. So I used that. I created a new material, which was called Lights Ground. And then let's just assign that to that new plane that I created. And this must have been a UV texture. So let's pull up the texture for that. Okay, so Lights Ground, yeah, it was UV. So let's just U and unwrap. Make sure that plane gets unwrapped. Um, and yeah, this is all that this is. It's just like a little, you know, it's a it's in Voronoi pattern. So set to distance, 4D, F1, Chebyshev. And then a color ramp was just kind of controlling the density of that. So super low, just added some really little lights so that when we're kind of entering our night scene, we've got a little interest happening on the ground. I've got my depth of field cranked a little too far right now though. So can't even really see him, but if we were to pull that up, you know, just have these little nice little sparkles on the ground. You could also turn those off during the day, but I found that they just weren't very visible. So at night, that just adds a little bit more depth to the um, sort of the floor of the scene. And I think that is about it for all the animation, which is really what I wanted to cover in this video. I won't leave you fully hanging with the materials though. Let's take a little bit of a look at those. So the paper texture is one that we had set up previously in the last video to get it looking sort of right. Um, but in this case, we did add some decals and I did a few other things that I thought were just general improvements to the texture. So rather than using just this alpha value to control the, to control kind of how see-through this was, I actually used a texture. So that was plugged in right there. So I use a noise texture. Again, just really fine texture, some sort of swirly patterns, plugging that into a color ramp to give it some depth, or sorry, to kind of just give it a little more contrast, and then using that to control the um, alpha value so that, you know, it's, it's almost like a fine pulp paper. And then I use that same texture to add a little bit of a bump map to it. So just using the you know, same color ramp output into the height and having that affect the normal of the object. Um, I left the transmission up pretty high, but lowered it because we were now using this alpha value to control that. Um, I thought it was okay to drop the transmission down a little bit so you couldn't see through it quite as well. But again, this is sort of all stylistic here. Now roughness. Okay, so this is where we get to the image texture. So let me just open that image texture really quickly and show you. This is one I use all the time. So this is just a black and white image with a few of my sort of icons on it, QR code. The QR code goes to my, my website, if you can imagine that. And I need to update this website, so don't actually go to dirk.com. You'd never, you'd never want to do that. But the texture, I basically took the plain object and then just added some seams. You can see we have a seam right there, sorry, right there. Um, we have a seam around each side of the, you know, the front and the back wing, adding some seams there, and then just um, pressing A to select everything and then U to unwrap it until you just sort of have all these different pieces. And I must be in an image editor, not a UV editor, until, yeah, you have the whole plane unwrapped. Um, now, I think we left the last video out with the subdivision surface still on there. So I just applied the subdivision surface so that I had access to sort of all this geometry and I wouldn't experience any stretching. Um, but then it's just a matter of going in and sort of selecting the different um, parts of the plane here. So just L to select, you know, sort of an island there. L to select the bottom. I want the top though. So L to select that. And then just, you know, in my top view, I can kind of just navigate these into place. Let's just actually rotate both these 90 degrees, for example scale them up together so I know that they're the same size. And then let's just put one in place. So this one maybe would get turned around this way, placing that one right around there, and then just doing the same thing on the other side and just line it up. Maybe rotate this one too. Again, this is just gonna depend on, you know, what your actual texture is there, but just lining those up. That's kind of how I created the, uh, you know, effect on the plane. And then for other areas, if you just want a small piece, you don't necessarily need to unwrap a whole area, you can just, Let's just sort of select two faces there and then control plus to grow the selection. You can do control plus and minus to grow your selection and then just you and unwrap. And then, you know, that's where I put the QR code, just kind of placing it. This is what I call like a sticker sheet. So I just use it to kind of haphazardly place decals around places. 
Um, but just repeat that process wherever you'd want some graphics. Um, and you could even just, you know, if you wanted like a little stripe detail, you know, I could just select that ring and then, you know, that's already unwrapped and just move that to a black area. Basically, you know, the reason I'm using a black and white texture is because, you know, black is basically off, white is on. So white being a value of one, black being a value of zero. And then if we look back into the shader, um, I just have, you know, when, when that gets mapped, I just use that to control all sorts of things. So in this case, the color ramp. So um, I could easily, you know, if we plug this all back together, I can just, just change this color to, you know, affect that. And uh, that that's a pretty straightforward use case there. But then I'm also using it to affect the strength of the, you know, paper texture. I wanted that to look a little bit more like a, you know, decal or something without so much uh, roughness to it. So had that go into a map range to control the strength of this just a little bit, just so that this piece was a little bit shinier. Also had that control, yeah, the roughness so that, you know, those pieces actually were a little bit shinier, looking a little bit more like a decal or something. Other thing to note here that's very important, when we are using the solidify modifier and doing this type of technique, you need to have two materials. So if I just had this one material, which I need to remove out of edit mode, um, that's going to be, when that gets projected down, you're gonna get sort of a double layer there. So we have that texture actually being projected through. And now sometimes that's not too bad, but that can start to create some sort of funky artifacts and just doesn't look super clean because realistically the decal would just be on the outside. You can see we have that double effect there. So what I basically do is create another version of the paper and I just named that paper in and then it's basically the same exact texture which you can control the variables a little bit differently if you want but it's the same texture just without the image texture linked up. So it's just a solid color and that was a way for me to get the decals to appear really just on that outer level. And the way to actually get that to work with the solidify modifier is to um, change this material offset right here. So just for the purposes of demonstration, if I take this paper in and change the viewport display to be um, like blue, for example, and then look in here, we'll see if we go and do the material offset right here. Oh, uh, because I'm in my texture view here, let's go to material and let's go out of X-ray. Oh, well, this of course also has transparency on it, so you can't even really see it. Let's bring this alpha back up. Anyways, yeah, so now we have, you know, even though this is just one object, the solidify is being told to take the second, you know, offset the, so the assigned material to this whole object is the paper. And then I'm telling with the solidify modifier for it to look one slot down to apply that to the actual inside. And that's where we're getting our paper in material. Um, so like I said, you could control this independently the outside would be the same. So just a little tip there on, you know, applying decals to a solid object where you only want the decal on the outside. So I think I covered almost everything, but there's one thing I also forgot about, which is this cute little rubber band detail in the middle. So this is super easy to set up. It's just kind of a nice, nice detail. Um, allows us to just tell a little bit more of a story of this being sort of a toy or something. Now I wanted this to loop, so I just had to kind of twist both directions, um, which is what you see here. But you could actually link this up with the rotation of the propeller if you want it to be super accurate. Uh, but let's just move that back down into place. Let me show you really quick how we make that. So we're gonna start with a plane, and I won't make the plane joke in this tutorial. We're gonna scale this on the x-axis just till it's pretty thin. Something like that I think would be good. And we can scale on the y-axis just, you know, till it's about the length of your plane. And then we're gonna press Control R to add an edge loop. And we are just gonna scroll way the heck up. Just keep scrolling till you got all sorts of cuts. That's good, something like that. And then in edge select mode, um, we're gonna type F3 and search for this command. So boundary loop, select boundary loop. So that's gonna select everything around the outside. And then I'm gonna do Control I to invert the selection and delete the edges. So now we just have this object. So it's basically just like, this ring with all these cuts in it, which is exactly what we want. So to actually give this some depth, we're gonna add in a skin modifier. Tab into edit mode, A to make sure everything's selected, and then control A to control the radius of this skin right here, just until it's about rubber band size. 
and you could add a subdivision surface, but this is going to become like a really heavy mesh if you do that. So I'm just not going to do that. And then to get it twisting, we're just going to add in a simple deform. So we'll have that set to twist and then just get your angle right. Um, your axis are and for me, Y is working and then just crank this up to something really high. You're going to have to type in probably a value here, but I'll only let you move it up to 360. But, um, yeah, basically we just, you know, let's have that say it starts and ends at this and in the middle, maybe it goes to negative that amount and let's insert keyframe. So then that is how you get your little rubber band twisting. Pretty easy. Again, it would be really cool if you like actually linked this up to the propeller motion. I tried doing that, but you know, I kind of want my propeller to be spinning the whole time. So it makes sense that this is a uh, still flying, but anyways, a little bit different than my normal tutorials. You know, I know we didn't completely walk through everything, but just kind of wanted to show you the different parts and pieces that went into creating this animation. I'm sort of in the pre-made file just so you can see it how I actually have everything set up. So I'll go ahead and save this. Um, let's open back up the sort of original final file. Just take a look at some of the differences. Um, so yeah, I had um, done a little bit of more work on this ground material. That's my lights object. So the, yeah, the earth material, I, you know, I used a color ramp. I wanted a little bit more fine control over the background colors beyond what I was getting with just that uh, mid journey output. So, you know, control the gamma, got some color ramp going in there. I had a random per island going in to sort of mix the color ramp version with the original version. Um, don't worry about that, but you know, I'll make it full screen real quick here. If you want to take a peek at that, um, feel free to just pause the video and take a look at exactly how my ground was set up. Um, besides that, I just added a few completely separate just house objects. These are just parented to the earth. And same thing I did with the clouds, just made sure they started off frame and then ended off frame and they just kind of pass, you know, briefly through the scene. Um, you don't, you don't really even notice them because it's pretty subtle, but, um, that's about it. Uh, I did have my animation all hooked up here. So let's take a look at that and let's make sure, do we cover everything? I think so. You know, we've got the propeller, we've got the plane moving around. We've got the textures on the plane. We've got the textures on the ground. We've got the clouds texture, we got the lightning, we got the underglow, we got the moon. Um, all in all, it comes together to make a really nice animation. Um, let's just take a look at my render settings very quickly. So I've got this set to 1200 pixels square, which is a decent resolution. That's what I uploaded to Instagram. Uh, I just rendered them straight to JPEGs because I just like the small file size. Now for sampling with volumes, things can get a little bit noisy. Um, but I still got by with just 300 samples. You know, you can see in the final, it wasn't too bad. Uh, just make sure you do have denoising on. Of course, if you have a GPU, make sure you're using that. Um, so I just set a output folder to render all the frames to. And then, you know, you can set a title for each frame if you want, which I think that was fly night or something is what FN stood for. Um, but put those all together and um, pulled up After Effects is actually how I assembled the video. That was pretty much it. Put all the frames together in After Effects, added some light color correction. The sounds I got from this website, Freesound. I'll put a link to that in the description, but that's just uh, that's just a place that has yeah a lot of free sound. Just make sure you search by CC0 if you don't want to get in any license issues. The sound of the propeller flapping, I actually made it with my mouth, just like something like that. <laughs> and uh, repeated it a bunch of times and, and I kind of got my effect there. So have some fun with this. Uh, really excited to see what everyone comes up with. This is a really fun animation to make. I haven't done sort of this toy style in a while and I thought it was a lot of, a lot of fun. But anyways, this will be the exact file that I upload to Patreon that has all the animation and sort of the final tweaked stuff in there if you want to inspect that a little further. But really we covered it all in the tutorial. So if you haven't checked out that first plane tutorial, definitely watch that build yourself a little toy plane, and then come back to this one, animate it, share it on Instagram, Twitter, X, uh, Facebook, you know, wherever, TikTok, social media, you want to share it. We'd love to see what you come up with, but thank you so much for being here and uh, I'll see you next time. Peace. Like, and subscribe. Bye.